started lunch. Uh, my name is Ben, and we're going to talk about uh, Viagra. Uh, I'll start with a demo. I got a pill. <laughs> let's, let's not do that uh, now, perhaps after the talk. OK, so we, we only have 25 minutes, and uh, I have lots of slides. So uh, let's, get, uh, let's get started. We're going to talk about Viagra. Uh, uh, and the uh, biggest uh, um, cybercrime spam campaigns in the world. And we're going to show some of the nice uh, um, sub-campaigns that were used uh, by uh, people selling Viagra. And uh, we're going to get into some uh, nice uh, stuff. So let's get it started. Uh, this is me, Ben. I have two children. I work as the security uh, research group manager for Imperva. And um, uh, that's, that's me. So first of all, we're talking about Viagra. So you know, there are a lot of pun jokes, like it was really hard to make this presentation. And uh, uh, let's, let's get the, let's make, to make a short story long and uh, all the pun jokes. So I, I decided to get it over with in three, stri in three slides. So first, okay, two. And, and three. Okay, now we're good. Now we can start talking. Okay, so it all starts with this. This is uh, sildenafil citrate, aka Viagra. And uh, it was uh, discovered when uh, the scientists at Pfizer, uh, f uh, they built a new, they designed a new medicine for angina and other uh, heart muscular problems. And they tr started testing it on people, and it didn't quite help with the angina, but everybody was very happy with the experiment. So they, they thought that it would be better to sell it as an erectile dis dysfunction medicine. So uh, quick skipping the, uh, the economical part, but it's still very interesting, and that's the motivation why uh, there's so much cyber crime and uh, other types of crime around uh, these types of uh, uh, drugs. So it was patented at 1996, and immediately uh, people started selling counterfeit uh, drugs of uh, Viagra. And then now we're in a very tricky situation where in Canada the patent got invalidated. So they have actually generic Viagra, which is much cheaper than uh, the US version. Uh, so there is a, a market for parallel import of Viagra, lots of money involved. And uh, in EU, in several countries, it also got expired, the patent. So lots of parallel import, which is illegal by the FDA because they want to protect the uh, big uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies. So we're in a, an interesting point. So it sounds very legitimate to say, yeah, all I'm doing is selling some Canadian uh, drug that does the same which actually ships from China or India, and in, in many cases has nothing to do with actual sildenafil citrate. So, and that's the trouble with it. And now this stopped working. Okay, so uh, a bit again about the economics of uh, this and why it's so tempting to do that. Uh, so this is Cristiano Ronaldo, the most expensive athlete in the world. And this is the uh, Viagra market. Uh, 30 Cristiano Ronaldos, and uh, imagine that in Messi they could actually score goals. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but let's get uh, to our business. This has a delay, I think. Okay, so getting back to our industry, this is the average software engineer salary, and this is the so uh, software engineer salary in Viagra. I will just use the keyboard because this has a delay. Okay, so this is the uh, Viagra in uh, software engineers. And actually, we're only halfway, so another screen like that. So that's a lot of, uh, a lot of money involved. And that's just Viagra. There are many other uh, medicines out there and many other counterfeit medicines out there. Uh, Viagra is here, about number 30, 40 in the list. Uh, we have uh, medicines that are, uh, that are making much more money and also the counterfeit uh, medicine. About 10% of the uh, pharma market is fake, is counterfeit. That's $21 billion per year. So that's a lot. That's according to the World Health Organization. And according to the Interpol, according to the Interpol, 
the annual death toll uh, from counterfeit uh, drugs is over one million people. I would take that with a grain of salt, okay? Uh, because A, they have a motivation to inflate the number uh, and, uh, and B, they're the Interpol. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but it, it would be a couple of hundred thousand at least. So that's, uh, that's uh, important to remember. And from some campaigns that were, uh, where people actually got arrested and the companies were shut down, uh, we can actually see the tip of the iceberg uh, with companies like GlovMed that made uh, a revenue of $67.7 million in a year. So, yeah, it's a big market. No wonder why it's the biggest spam campaign in the world. We've seen lots of uh, motivation, uh, economical motivation, because it's not like a Jeep that you can't ship to places. It's just you put it in a small box and you ship it anywhere. It's a very lucrative uh, industry. It's very easy to make it look like it's uh, just sell, uh, selling parallel import of stuff. So let's say that you want to start uh, making some money from illegal trafficking of uh, Viagra, OK? So first of all, there are uh, many affiliate pro uh, pro programs, uh, mainly in uh, Russian, of course. Uh, this is an example of one of them, and they offer very lucrative uh, terms, uh, 30 to 50% commission, which is more than you'd get from uh, Amazon or eBay affiliate program, uh, templates, banners, and everything you need to get up and running, uh, different languages, uh, kits, and uh, API support, so you can run a real operation, and uh, etc. And they know who they're selling it to. Uh, they're saying, where do you get the traffic? Mainly from email dispatches, which is a nice word for spam. And the ways are limited by your, your imagination. And where they stress out, you know, we guarantee anonymity. We don't care where you get the traffic as long as we get the traffic and we can sell those drugs. And then you're getting those templates, like the Canadian pharmacy in here, or like the United Pharmacy in here, and he's smiling because he has hair. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, or CVS or Indian Pharmacy, etc., etc. So you're getting all of these templates, and now you're ready to go uh, to work. And unless you're selling that to your uh, grandma, you need to find some actual people uh, who will buy this. Because every time you start a business, like when you're starting selling cookies as a child, you always go to your grandma to sell them. But you can't sell your grandma Viagra because your grandfather is no longer alive. And well, oh. a Rough story. <laughs> OK, so let's say that, <laughs> never mind. Can you please scratch that off when you edit? <laughs> OK, so. Uh, you have a couple of ways to proceed when you want to get traffic to your, uh, to your uh, uh, campaign. You can go spam or SEO. SEO, search engine optimization, let's go to the first way. So we have white hat SEO and black hat SEO. In this, in this case, we would go for black hat SEO because A, you don't want something that will be uh, legitimate but will take a lot of time, and B, we don't care. We know that our website is going to be alive for maybe a month or two. We just want some quick traffic and then uh, we're out and we're starting the new one. So this is from a research we did. We found some uh, interesting uh, SQL injection attacks, like here's a user agent, and afterwards uh, a SQL query. Uh, this one is aimed at uh, MSSQL. It looks for the databases that are not system databases, and it looks for varchar or string uh, columns. And then it, it, it loops, it updates the, the tables in these databases, and then it does like a drawing, a modulo of new ID, which is random number. And if it's zero, that means in 10% of the cases, it, added, it adds this uh, uh, spam link. It's invisible, so you know you don't want anyone to notice and remove your links, and uh, and you also have other links in there. So this is the result. You you get this injected. These are sites that uh, that uh, got this uh, injected in Google, and it's a really high scale operation. They they try to attack uh, tons of uh, web applications. So. That's about SEO. Let's talk a little bit about spam. So you would need a domain to send people to. You would need email lists. Let's not even get into that. There are so many email lists for uh, uh, little or no money. And you will need email servers. Now you can uh, both use uh, open SMTP servers or uh, crack, uh, cracked SMTP servers or IMAP servers uh, to send uh, emails, or you can use websites. So 
in uh, a campaign we found, uh, hackers used uh, uh, vulnerabilities, mainly CMS vulnerabilities like WordPress uh, file upload vulnerabilities to upload uh, WSO. Uh, you can see it at GitHub. It's one of the most popular uh, web shells out there. And then once they got control of the website, they sent the command. Uh, with WSO, A is action, is the action you want to do, and P is the payload. P1 is the payload in this case. And they send a base64 to decode, base64 string, which takes a base64 string inside a, a file to write it, and then it does a custom, uh, it installs a custom shell on the server that, uh, that what it does it is send the emails. So it takes the strings uh, from, uh, from the post dat data, and then it explodes by a pipe, uh, splits it by a pipe, uh, a string that we called it a batryoshka because it's a bunch of base64 decodes. So it's a string that's base64 decode, then base64 decoded, then base64 decoded, then base64 decoded, then <laughs> you're a smart guy. <laughs> then base64 decoded, then base64 decoded, then it takes it, it's, it's split by a pipe, then it's additional three times on each uh, field, and then it just takes this field and it sends uh, the email. Why would they, uh, why would they, base64 uh, eight times is a good question, and I, I suppose that the answer is uh, that if uh, someone is uh, trying to decode base64 traffic and then see what, what's in there, they will just see a bunch of gibberish, and they wouldn't think to try eight times to base64 decode. However, it kind of ba uh, back, uh, backfired on the, on the attackers in this case. So uh, this is actually the first case in the world, I think, that you can overdose on base64, which is respect, okay? So, and it goes down to, and I will be happy to explain in more details if uh, someone wants later, but it goes down to uh, the way base64 worked. Base64 wor uh, is basically two to the power of eight instead of two to the power of, uh, uh, two to the power of six instead of two to the power of eight. You have 64 characters, that's A to Z, A to Z uppercase and numbers and plus and slash and backslash. Uh, and then you have only 64 characters. So when you take a character, instead of having the eight bits, you only have six bits and the, the additional bits goes to the next uh, character. Then you reconvert it to a representing ASCII character, right? According to a table that goes from zero to 63. And everything is good because you're switching the letters, you don't see anything, uh, it, it, it changes the, the string, and it's only human readable characters, so it, it doesn't do any encoding problems, etc. However, the letter V, as in Viagra, not related, okay? The letter capital V, the ASCII is 01010110, and the base64 is 010101. So when you encode V, capital V, what do you get in base64? You're the base64 expert. What do you get for capital V? You're getting a capital V as well. So you're getting stuck on the capital V, right? Now, there are three letters, capital T, capital U, and capital W, that gets you to capital V in one hop. So if you're encoding anything that starts with a capital T, or a capital T U or a capital W, you're getting to a capital V. So you're getting stuck in that capital V, okay? And on and on we go. These letters are two hops away from capital V. And uh, the rest of the uh, characters, any character, gets to a capital V after up to five uh, times of base64 decode. We even wrote a Python uh, uh, script that calculates, let's, let's run it, it calculates the, um, the amount of hops it takes for each character, so the maximum is five characters. So that's, that's really cool, uh, I think, at least for me, it's really cool. And after capital V comes uh, lowercase m, because of the same reasons, basically, you're getting, because you're reducing the amount of information, uh, you're, you're fixating yourself to, the, uh, to lowercase m, and then on and on it goes. So if you're seeing a string that starts with capital V, m, 0, w, t, 2, etc., you know that this string is so something that was base 64 lots of times. So that's uh, pretty interesting. Okay, moving on. Uh, we need, um, we don't need a domain, we need domains, okay? We need a lot of domains because they will get blacklisted like in a couple of weeks to the most. So we need lots of domains. 
and then we also need a way to bypass uh, spam filtering. Now, what I'm talking about, of course, is just describing part of the active campaigns in this, uh, uh, in this uh, operation, because it's an affiliate program and anyone can come up with different stuff. But this is a, a cool one that we, we found. So, again, they're using WSO as well. Uh, they're sending a PHP command, and it's sending a Base64 to run, and this time, it sends a Base64, which is inside, uh, uh, inside the script itself that's being ran. And what it does is it goes to HT Access and it puts the results of the decoded Base64 file in the HT Access. So what it puts in the HT Access file is actually a, a 404 redirection to, uh, to, to one of the uh, illegal domains, uh, to one of the blacklisted domains that the attacker is using. So the idea here is that if there's a spam uh, filtering uh, um, uh, algorithm or a control or a product, uh, it will uh, see that we are going to legitimate domain.com slash something something, okay? Uh, but eventually, it will redirect us to, uh, to a different uh, domain. So your site can be hacked, and you won't even know it unless you type the wrong address. Uh, we've seen other uh, similar ways of, uh, of abusing uh, this uh, type of thing. Uh, for example, by doing JavaScript redirection or pu pu putting a, a, a big uh, iframe on it. So this is basically how it works for this specific campaign because we find, found correlations between the domains that were sent in the spam list and the domains, uh, the, the dummy domains uh, used for redirection. So the attackers are attacking two sites, basically, or uh, in some cases it, it's the same site. In one of them they set the HD access and, and they keep doing it. So like if one of their domains gets blacklisted, they just rerun it automatically and set the routing to another domain and and that's that's all this uh, botnet does and uh, then the other one is installing the batryoshka uh, uh, backdoor the one that sends the emails to the uh, to the victims to the uh, spam recipients and it's using just php mail uh, command so it's using the a mail server of that, uh, uh, of that uh, website. And then the spam is sent to a user. Uh, it, uh, in most cases, I, I suppose, it uh, bypasses the spam uh, filtering because it's a legitimate domain, a legitimate URL in a legitimate domain. And then the clients, the, the ones who are supposed to purchase the pills, they go into this and redirect, uh, are redirected to the, um, to the, counterfeit uh, drugs website. So something interesting about this, I mentioned there's a lot of money here. So in most cases, when we see backdoor activity, we see uh, the activity from several IPs or from Tor network or from anonymous proxies. Uh, but in this case, it was used by over 80,000 IPs. So they have a lot of money. They can buy better services to better buffer themselves from uh, the attack. Something that's interesting here is that most actual botnets we have, we, in regards to DDoS, in regards to lots of things, uh, do have a lot of uh, presence from the US because uh, there's lots of computers in the US. In, in, in this one, uh, it's negligible uh, numbers from the US and we have high numbers from countries where we, uh, it's uncommon to see attacks from like Algeria, Egypt and such, which is interesting. Uh, and we hardly see any traffic from Canada which is uh, kind of sad, given it uh, the Canadian pharmacy. But you see that it's not a Canadian pharmacy. So we see a lot of uh, uh, IPs from Russia, and, uh, and, but we, like I said, we see from Egypt, Algeria, etc. This is a partial, uh, uh, this is a part of the domains that were used. All of these were registered in the same uh, day. There are uh, thousands of these domains. And uh, I, uh, if anyone wants the list of the domains, uh, they can send me a Twitter message or email, and I will happily send the, the domains list. So this is just one day. So there's a real DevOps operation going in here uh, in the dark side. Uh, people are keep buying domains. 
they automate probably the uh, domains that are being bought. Uh, sometimes we see like a wave of buying Indian domains. Sometimes we see uh, uh, other waves. So they're buying lots of domains and they do all of these uh, spam things. And th this is just part of the uh, campaign that uh, they are ru running. So wrapping it up, first of all, um, first of all, I think that it's interesting. Where there is money, there will al always be a tax. So these campaigns of uh, Canadian pharmacy and uh, other pharmaceutical campaigns, they exist for a very long time, for a decade, over a decade, uh, and they still run in full speed because there's still lots of money to be made in here. So that's, uh, that's one thing. And the other thing uh, interesting here is that uh, like Mirai, where devices were attacked, and uh, they were attacked just as a means to get to get, uh, to get uh, resources for a DDoS attack. In here as well, uh, devices or web applications were attacked uh, as a mean to uh, redirect people to other web uh, to other websites, which is a kind of not the usual defacement. So I think it's uh, pretty nice. Um, Will Dunk. <laughs> hope it's good. Thank you very much. And Any questions? Okay, cool. Then I think, thanks, Ben. Oh, one more. <laughs> I know, I know, don't worry. <laughs> So you said that 10% of uh, the pharma industry is fake, counterfeit. Not me, the no, World Health Organization. Okay, I World didn't Health check. Organization. Okay. Um, but say 90% of it then is legitimate, mm -hmm. but pharmacy companies really don't have much of an incentive to lower their prices to push this whole economics to the side, do they? Yes, well, they, they, they don't have the, well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an economics game. Mm -hmm. And since they're getting it in a much reduced uh, price, and it's, it's also the same for legitimate drugs. When the patent runs out and it, it becomes de generic, uh, you see it with legitimate drugs as well. The price to, make the dr to actually make the drugs is very low in comparison with the price uh, you sell the drug because most of it reflects the R&D involved in actually uh, working on the, the drug itself. So they don't have the incentive to lower the prices to one cent, let's say, but uh, there's a lot of margin to work here, uh, to work with here. So, uh, you know, going from $80 to $18, you still get a lot of money and that's if you, uh, you need to take that with a grain of salt as well, are you really getting the drug that you ordered I don't know. I I haven't tried ordering yet. Fair enough. <laughs> Thanks. I'm in Amsterdam. I can just go to a store and buy it. Anyone else? <coughs> I will I will try to see if there is a matching uh, concur category for uh, Viagra. Uh, okay. So anyone anyone else? Uh, feel free, of course, to talk to me or send an email or. Tweet or whatever. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. <laughs>